you are very welcome to this question and answer video. OK, a question about the Ukraine war, which actually is two questions, so I split them up and will answer each of them in turn. At what point does the UK become an active combatant in Ukraine, either by definition or from Russia's perspective? By definition, if members of the British Armed Forces are active in conflict, killing Russian soldiers under the command of the British military. All the stuff about supplying weapons and intelligence and all the rest, these are things that countries have done to support or oppose different sides in conflict for many decades, without being seen to cross that line. You can still decide when you do or you don't approve of that. The EU might strongly disapprove of Iran selling drones to Russia, for instance, to the degree that they might want to sanction them. But they don't therefore conclude that the state of Iran has become an actual combatant in the war. Now, the question about Russia's perception is another matter, because perceptions depend on all sorts of things that are harder to gauge and are not so consistent. This is why Western countries have been feeling their way very carefully into this. Initially weapons, but not long range weapons that might be used to hit Russia itself. And then, well, OK, maybe long range weapons, but not tanks. And now, well, OK, maybe tanks, but definitely not aircraft. Each time they are looking nervously at Russia, wondering if any individual escalation of support might be taken of tipping over whatever line exists in Putin's head when somebody asks about who, when you become a combatant. And this is the advantage, to some extent, of the person positioned as the not wholly rational and yet powerful leader. Trump had this going for him as well. Your opponents have no idea what you might or might not do. They can't calmly calculate what's in your interest and make presumptions. Because the crazy leader's perception of their interest may be so different. And that puts everyone else off balance. It's a bit like nuclear deterrence. Maybe the leader never would push the nuclear button because of the huge consequences. But it only works if the other side thinks you might. Which takes us neatly to the next question. At what point does Russia take the view that as it is already in a war with NATO based on its members supplying significant military equipment to its adversary, it will expand its military operation and target those countries' military interests? Unless we believe Putin actually is a crazy person and beyond reason, and I don't personally believe that, you have to consider why it would be in Russia's interest to do that. It's widely held, and I have no doubt that it's true, that if NATO and Russia entered a shooting war directly against each other, NATO's conventional military power massively outstrips Russia's, and it would be a relatively quick win. And then you would be down to that one last choice, which is exactly what NATO and everyone else is trying to avoid, because Russia is a nuclear power. Putin is quite clear that if he feels the integrity of the Russian state is on the line, and total defeat by NATO would certainly count in his mind, then he will respond with a full nuclear strike. Probably America could win a nuclear war with Russia, but, you know, it doesn't count. A large-scale nuclear strike would be lose-lose for all the peoples of the world. But would that stop NATO responding if directly attacked? Well, of course not. You would have to respond. Just try to do so in a way less likely to escalate to that all-out nuclear endpoint. The point of all that is I can't see why Putin would ever think he could achieve useful military objectives by actually declaring war on NATO. Where's the path to success that he could paint for that scenario? I mean, it doesn't exist. Not right now, anyway. Even his allies, particularly China, have been letting him know that they don't appreciate the destabilisation his war has brought about. Even the nominal support they've been giving him would likely dry up if he widened the war front from beyond Ukraine. So, no, don't see that happening by deliberate choice. History shows that almost all wars are instigated by a dynamic leader of one of the warring countries. Hitler, Kaiser Wilhelm, Napoleon, kings and emperors of various countries and even popes. Each of these leaders had some type of hold on their country's population and convinced them that going to war was the only solution to whatever problem they were espousing. Do you think that Chairman Xi or Putin or even Kim Jong-un could be one of these people or anyone else? Let's take your premise as solid for the purpose of this answer. 
I mean, I don't know if a historian would agree with your take or not on what history shows. But, well, Putin clearly is, because he's already done exactly that. And he maintains broad support amongst his own population for the war, in principle at least. Whether or not that support would survive a future where Russia lost the conflict is another question. Kim Jong-un is a wild card, no realistic route for him to advance an ideological or political goal by starting a literal war. You have to deal with him as the crazy person who might do something hugely damaging in spite of the fact there's no rationality for it. Xi Jinping is a wholly different story. Two things have been a long feature of Chinese history. One, China has never sought to create a global empire. It was always enough to restore China's maximalist borders, which includes Taiwan, of course. Second, the Chinese fought wars mostly when they have achieved a position of strategic advantage, a preference that often means you don't have to fight at all. Wars get fought when you have two sides of roughly equal strength, they've always said. The Chinese way is to see the long game, to bend in the face of assaults in the short term and then rebuild that strategic advantage until it becomes the natural and irresistible consequence that the push goes back in their favour. Now, how much is Xi Jinping a product of his history and culture and how much does he represent a break from tradition? I would say it's mixed. I think if American engagement and authority weakened, so if the US indulged itself with a civil war, for instance, or if it gains leadership that pulls back on its support for Taiwan, then she definitely has the steel and the population support to lead a takeover of Taiwan. But Chinese history makes me think his first choice would be to continue building the strength of the Chinese military until it becomes accepted as inevitable that Taiwan will rejoin the mainland and its citizens begin to negotiate with that reality. If we end up with China and America engaging as near equals in a fight to the death, it would be the result of a failure of leadership, not the determination of a charismatic leadership to achieve world domination. There's a lot more that could be said on that topic. Is there a path we can take to encouraging more competent people to become politicians in the UK government? And do you think there's anything specific that could be changed within the civil service to push that forward? First of all, it's worth saying that there are some competent people in Parliament now. People easily dismiss the whole political class as a group, and it's a group that often makes it easy to do just that. But there are always a number of individuals who have competence and integrity. Some of them get promoted. A lot of them don't. The problem is that the party political processes that select leaders and then governments tend not to select the competence first and foremost. Some of them do, sometimes. Most will focus more on ideological fit to the electing group. And they persuade themselves that people who think like them ideologically are competent by definition. Competence often comes with pragmatism, though, so it's not something that works out except when competent people extend that competence to playing the system. Could we encourage more competent people to see a career for themselves in politics? Well, sure. But all politicians in the social media age get hated on by a highly vocal population. They get the blame for everything, the credit for nothing. You have to be very public spirited to want to make a contribution in that way when that's the price. Now, except when an MP is attacked, physically assaulted, at that point, suddenly people talk about how much they appreciate the work their representatives do. Once the shock of that has faded away, then we're back to business as usual. The trouble is, as well, that people who are competent outside of politics, say business leaders, often find that they crash and burn when they enter politics because they're used to systems that are facilitating rapid decision making, proper execution of decisions. And then they find that the political model requires slower decisions with more consultation and engagement. Then the civil service might find 20 ways not to implement something if they think it's wrong. You asked if something could be changed in the civil service. Almost certainly, I don't have enough of a handle on the current state of the system there to say specifically what. But it's a huge bureaucracy that seems to have gotten slower and less effective in recent times. I doubt the solutions to that are simple. They are certainly urgent. It would require a lot more research and consideration to come up with something more concrete than that. 
I'm sure that's not a wholly satisfactory answer, but it reflects the situation and why it's rather stuck. What do you think of person-first language? Beneficial, harmless or harmful to society? And they provided a link to this page, the Elimination of Harmful Language Initiative. Person-first language, according to this site, is language that seeks not to define people by one characteristic. So, instead of convict, use person who is incarcerated. Instead of disabled person, use person with a disability. Instead of the homeless, talk about people without housing, and so on. I'm not a fan. It's one of those adaptations that's based on the concept that we should generally expect to be fragile to how we're described. Rather than obsessing over the language, building people's confidence to define themselves by their positive attributes, regardless of whatever else might apply, would be a better approach. If you've got homeless people in your city, spend your time worrying about how to tackle homelessness, not over what to call them to give them dignity in their existing state. I doubt they care much about what you call them. They care about sleeping on the streets in minus 5 to 7 degree temperatures. And if you don't agree, feel free to call me an old git. The phenomenon wasn't covered on the harmful language list, although you're not allowed to call me a grey beard, apparently. Even though I have a beard, and even though it's grey. So I will have to wear old git as a badge of pride until that one gets banned for the sake of my fragile ego. In the terms in which you ask the question, I think it's harmless by dint of its lack of compelling power, but it's based on a false premise that would become harmful if it gained more widespread traction. Hi Malin, what is your take on 15 minute cities? Will they achieve anything they claim and how much will they limit our freedoms? So this is something that came out of a series of frankly hysterical stories about plans that were publicised about Oxford UK. Whether they'll achieve what they claim depends on what you think they claim because there are some pretty wild versions circulating around. When I looked at it a few months ago, the 15-minute city was an urban planning thing dating back from 2016 that said that across the various zones of the city, everyone should have essential services like shops, schools, pubs, whatever, within 15 minutes walking distance. That would encourage less congestion around the city, higher quality of life, particularly for elderly people who aren't mobile or people who can't afford to run a car. And as that stands seems on the face of it to be a good idea. I mean, I live in a tiny village. I would like to have a good village shop, a pub and a social centre within the village because obviously that makes it convenient. It encourages a sense of local community, which is good. But this Oxford thing blew up when some climate change sceptics grabbed hold of a separate, not entirely related plan in Oxford to place traffic restrictions on certain routes. And this was, as far as I could see, about reducing congestion. But these excitable folks started spreading the story that Oxford was trying to introduce climate lockdowns and people would be prevented from leaving their area at all. That the 15-minute city thing was intended to be a hard barrier that you weren't allowed to get out of. That bore no relation to any description of a scheme produced by the council, but the story spread powerfully. Council members started getting large numbers of abusive and threatening calls, so great job there, everybody. The point is, the congestion measure was never intended to stop people from going wherever they wanted, save to reduce the number of times per year they could use for specifically congested roads. So if they still wanted to go the city centre or anywhere else, nothing was stopping them from going out to the ring road using a perfectly good route that was a bit longer and didn't suffer from the high levels of congestion. In other words, it was a non-story. And it would have to be. Local councils don't have the powers to restrict people to a specific area. They don't have the legal authority to do it. And if they tried, not aware of any that has, they'd be voted out in double quick time. Now, is their congestion scheme a well-designed scheme? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Councils introduce badly thought through traffic rules all the time. Maybe this is one of those, maybe it isn't. Let's face it, if you accepted that's all it was, we wouldn't be discussing it here. Rather, it's a reflection of the power that people spreading nonsense have on our perceptions of what's going on and why. 
I mean, there may be some idiots on the council in Oxford, there are on most other councils, but this scheme doesn't restrict people's freedoms because, I say it again, even if those idiots wanted it to, it's not within their power. And it's not uncommon that motorists don't like measures brought in to deal with congestion. No doubt sometimes the policies are genuinely dumb, other times they just don't like being told what they can and can't do, even when the alternative is that they end up sat for ages in stationary traffic, presumably going, yay, freedom! I don't really blame councils for trying to come up with something better than gridlock. Now, I say that, I don't have any opinion on the Oxford scheme. I'm just not that interested in urban city planning and traffic management. Now look, at the real heart of this question is one about creeping eco-authoritarianism. And that's a valid thing to be keenly interested in within the real world. But the problem is, just like the true catastrophists amongst the environmentalists who see eco-doom with every stretch of extreme weather, so too the anti-net-zero alarmists see eco-fascism with every policy proposal. In democratic societies, we won't see eco-authoritarianism by the implementation of rules that directly forbid you to do certain things. What will happen, if it happens at all, is people will add restrictions to infrastructure and access to services. So, for instance, in Wales this week, the strongly green-minded Labour government there scrapped all major road-building projects. Full stop. It said that all future roads must be able to show that they will not increase carbon emissions, not increase the number of cars on the road, not lead to higher speeds and must not negatively impact the environment. Which is just another way of saying we ban all new roads. Because even when every vehicle's an electric one, no new road will be able to meet all of those criteria. Indeed, enabling higher speeds is one of the benefits of new roads. So figure it out. Now, that action doesn't mandate that anyone has to stay at home, doesn't tell anyone per se what they can and can't do, but the friction caused by using overcapacity existing roads will nevertheless provide a soft disincentive to people to drive. And that's the sort of way that such decision makers seek to influence how you lead your life, making the choices they approve of easier, the ones they don't harder. And that's if they're competent. In Wales, the public transport is also crappy, according to all reports anyway, so it's not even being done well in its own terms. If they overreach, you still have the option to elect them out, which is exactly why they take the indirect approach, where blame can be displaced. It becomes a pain to travel. You end up blaming that there's too many cars on the road. Now, some will blame the transport planning, but mostly people will blame what they can see in front of them, which is the other people. So what I'm saying is, there are definitely some things to be concerned about. Bad policy prompted by zealots. Don't fall for every mirage that anti-net zero campaigners will try to conjure up to feed red meat to their supporters. They are trying to manipulate you. Do you think many people are aware that digital IDs are to be introduced at the end of 2023 and that the government is currently holding a public consultation on them, allegedly? I think awareness of the digital ID is currently very low. So the current thinking is people can apply to have a digital ID, which can then be used online or in person to be taken as verification of identity in the way that a driving license or a passport is often used at the moment. Available via a phone app or a website. The government currently stresses, because let's face it, it doesn't have much choice, that there will be no requirement to have one. Citizens will be able to stick with physical documents if they prefer. I wouldn't blame anyone for being a tad cynical about that reassurance, because I think it's fair comment to say that this is a ratchet move. It'll be introduced, non-compulsory, very non-intrusive, but over time, if it's useful from the government's point of view, then incentives will be introduced. And then some way down the line, there will come along a good reason because something always comes along, to give it a harder push. If it had been brought in 10 years ago, no doubt the pandemic might well have been that occasion. And I don't think any of that is conspiratorial, by the way. There's no big long-term plan. I mean, the current government knows it's not going to be around for much longer in any case, 
It's just a very natural and obvious direction of travel. Unless UK citizens make it clear they don't want it in any form. So there were similar proposals by the Blair government and those were abandoned. Maybe these will be too. I mean, look, I'm not a fan. Equally, there are many countries I could live in that require you to have ID on you at all times. So I'm not preparing to flee the country just yet. The truth is, right now, with all the technology around us, if the government, actually if any government, wanted to know exactly what you're up to, they could. I'm not saying that's a good thing. It is the status quo. Digital ID will make elements of that more accessible to lower level officials. It's a step change, not a revolution. Hi, Malin. Which of the following climate tribes would you most closely identify with? It then pointed to a description that had these various descriptors. Energy maximalism, climate urbanism, climate tech, eco-globalism, environmentalism, neo-pastoralism and doomerism. These are labels for campaigners, really. People who are arguing for a particular approach to the future, which of course I don't do here. If I did, the answer to the question would probably be obvious from the content of these videos. And these different tribes tend to have different collections of features. Pro or anti-economic growth, techno-optimist or techno-pessimist, individualist or collectivist, optimistic or pessimistic about the future, abundance mindset or scarcity mindset. The thing is, they're not mutually exclusive if you're not an active campaigner. I'm open to and interested in what happens. Listing simplistic features like that also doesn't allow for nuance, which of course I'm rather keen on. So out of those features, I am pro-economic growth, although growth of what and to the benefit of whom are subsidiary questions. Because economic growth is tied to real life processes, you should never lose sight of the physical reality that the numbers are describing. I'm techno-optimist, but you have to be averse to hypsterism. I'm individualist in spirit, but we live in societies that are necessarily a blend of both. So it's understanding what belongs where to maximise the benefits of each and minimise the downsides of each. At heart, I'm optimistic about the relatively near future. In the long term, the sun goes nova and the earth fries, but the next couple of thousand years could be really exciting times to be alive. I see the historical success of an abundance mindset. I also see examples around me where that prompts complacency. So again, yes, I fall on the abundance side, but wide open to the realities we're seeking to describe. At the end of all that, we can conclude that I'm not a doomer. For ones who believe that there's no hope for the future, I'm not a neo-pastoralist who thinks we have to return to a heavily romanticised simpler time. I'm not an environmentalist, defined here as being anti-growth, anti-corporate, anti-progress. And I'm not an eco-globalist, defined here as using a global rules-based system to impose a scarcity mindset, which is the reasonably good non-hysterical way of describing the WEF agenda. Not all the ideas they come up with are as terrible as the ones that get the most attention, but it's certainly not how I would define myself. Sorry, Klaus. With the rest, I can see elements that I would support. No society is going to conform to any one of these visions exclusively, but I could live broadly within a society that leans towards any of those remaining. Now, this next question is a bunch of related questions stitched together, so I've trimmed it down a little. I hear Elon Musk claiming that depopulation is a huge threat to society. Peter Zihan makes a similar argument. Simultaneously, we have groups that promote depopulation and an end to growth. What's the real truth? Some studies indicate we need three or four planets to support the current population at Western standards. And demographically, we know we're heading towards 9 to 10 billion people before we level off. What is the planet's real carrying capacity? The honest answer to that is we don't know to the point of precision that people imply. What we discovered with the innovation of artificial fertilisers and then improved energy sources and the green revolution is that carrying capacity is a concept based on the current ability to extract value from input resources and that it's not fixed. 
for pessimists who calculate that we're about to exceed carrying capacity or already are doing that, they look at existing patterns of behaviour, existing reservoirs and sources of resource and extrapolate with a bunch of straight lines into the future. And in that sense, they're right. If none of those factors changed, then we would hit the Malthusian barriers with the unpleasant consequences that follow. So far, we've always found powerful ways to change the equation, to increase carrying capacity and to avoid those consequences. And that leaves us a, a debate between people who, without evidence, suggest that that won't happen next time and therefore we're screwed, arguing with those that, without evidence, say that this improvement inevitably always happens and therefore we could never be screwed, ever, because we're so genius, we can get ourselves out of scrapes, powered only by the infinite energy of total complacency. It seems reasonable to be hopeful that if the human race utilises the technology it now has available, with genetic modification, with technology-assisted agriculture, with next-generation nuclear, so on and so on, if the population settles at 10 billion, then that would likely be supportable. Whether it stays at 10 billion or actually starts a decline remains to be seen because big demographic shifts are happening over the course of the next century. Who knows what happens? We've not been here before. Elon Musk is right to note some of the negative consequences of that shift. Bleating that everyone should follow him in having more babies is unlikely to be a strategy that provides for solutions, I'm guessing. But on today's practices, we will fail. Complacency is not a renewable resource. We actually have to treat all this as a problem that has to be solved and to be open to the solutions that are obviously the route to solving it. The dual problems. Musk's challenge, growing productivity side by side with a declining human workforce at the same time as having a growing elderly population. And the other problem, the Malthusians worry, maintaining a planet healthy enough to keep providing life support for us as absolute global human numbers hit the highest they've ever been. We can't pick one, we have to do both. Have admired your rational both sides approach since first encountered, but distressed by recent discourse on Russian-German undersea pipeline recently destroyed by the US. Both President Biden and a female official stated prior to the event that the pipeline would cease to exist. US also benefits financially. I would hope that we could disagree on something like that without it actually distressing anybody. And I don't think you should admire an approach which is about open-minded rationality without expecting it to be applied to certain things that your gut instinct tells you is definitely something. Because that's not how open-minded rationality works. It's entirely possible that the US is indeed responsible. I mean, its secret services have a long history of covert interventions, up to and frequently including engineering coups. At the same time, there's no hard evidence that they did this. It's entirely possible Russia is responsible. Its forces have a long history of covert interventions, up to and including blowing airplanes out of the sky and then denying it but there's currently no hard evidence that they did this either. Now, you can decide to place huge weight on a few words that Joe Biden muttered in a press conference. Maybe you should. Putin has a track record of acting without mumbling, so I will hold my judgment. I would point out that many of the opponents of Joe Biden make a lot out of what they describe as his senility and how he blurts out weird stuff all the time that doesn't make sense. But here, they're focusing on a few ambiguous words, taking them very seriously, very specifically, layering implied meaning beyond what he actually said, and promoting that over the explicit denials from the administration that they were behind the action. Again, maybe they're right to do that. They didn't enjoy it when the other side did it to Trump, who would also blurt out occasional random stuff that just came into his head. Take him seriously, but not literally, became the formula that Republicans used to promote. And then the opposition would jump onto those words and take them very literally, if they thought that by doing so they could suggest he was saying that, for instance, white supremacists were very fine people. 
It was obviously not his intent when he spoke, but this process of laughing at the incoherence until it's politically helpful to claim absolute specific accurate intent. I can only look at all of that and decide it serves the interests of truth to reserve judgment. Maybe if Americans could start electing leaders who can speak in joined up sentences, that would be a good thing as well. Help us have these sorts of conversations in the future, just as a by the by. I also think you need to be clear about real motivations versus fantasy conspiracy ones. Because in a time of war, the relatively small amount of money that the US LNG business will make is not likely to be a factor. The same on the Russian side come to that. Whatever decisions were taken by either side were taken on strategical geopolitical grounds, not on commercial ones. If Russia was purely looking after commercial interests, it wouldn't have launched the war in the first place. If America were doing likewise, it probably would have given Ukraine minimal support and allowed Russia to complete its invasion quickly with minimal world disruption, which would have been better for its economy. So given I take the approach that I do, I'm not going to be leaping to a conclusion on this one. By all means, express a sense of where you think the weight of possibilities might lie. We will see how it plays out. But don't blame me for not immediately jumping to the same gut conclusion that you have when there's no hard evidence either way. It's not what I do here, mostly. I mean, I'm human, no doubt I've done it sometimes. But that's when I let myself down, not when I've got it right. Even if my gamble on that gut instinct turned out to be correct. Because, you know, even a broken clock is right twice a day. All right. Thanks to my patron supporters for the questions. See you for the news roundup on Friday, where I suspect the resignation of the Scottish First Minister might well make an appearance. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please share with anyone else you think would also enjoy it. Word of mouth is really important to us. And if you've not subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? As the saying goes, that subscribe button won't smash itself. So.